Hello and welcome to the Core Advantage Podcast. My name is Darren McInnes. And I'm Jacob Tober. Uh, on the podcast, we talk about all things sports science, strength and conditioning, and athletic development. You'll find links, show notes, and references in the podcast details and also on our website. Hey guys, uh, welcome to a very special episode of the Core Advantage Podcast, our first online interview with uh, a very special guest, Dr. Stuart McGill. Uh, I won't go into detail about just how impressive and important and uh, how much of a leader he's in the field because I get into that, but uh, we couldn't be more excited to have had him on the show, so we, we really hope you like it. It was an awesome, awesome episode. Uh, Stu was fantastic and so generous with his time and thoughts and ideas. Uh, apologies a little bit about the audio quality. It's mm. not going to be the crispest Core Advantage podcast you'll ever listen to because of the joys of Wi-Fi and internet and computer recording, so apologies for that. It's advance. worth persevering though with, uh, I think. And yeah, it's still audible. It's still definitely worth persevering with. It's fantastic. Uh, we're about to dive into the episode right now. Before we do, though, here's an Iron Edge pro tip, and we'll see you on the other side in the episode. Hey, everyone. Jacob here with another Iron Edge pro tip. This one is an offset loaded carry with a trap bar 2.0. Fantastic exercise, fantastic loaded carry variation because the weight is in both hands, but significantly loaded to one side. So you really have to work that offset suitcase carry style walk. So as I walk, what's important is you stay upright, shoulders back and set, head in neutral, and you keep your feet walking parallel with your hips. So try not to walk on a thin monorail, but instead walk on parallel train tracks. So your feet are staying hip width apart as you go. Obviously make sure you load both sides, so you do some with the weight in your right side, some with the weight in your left, and try not to lean towards or away from the weight as you go. That's your Iron Edge Pro Tip. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Random Thought Show. Hi, guys. Um, we are joined by the specialist of special guests, Dr. Stuart McGill, today. I, I've been wanting to tell people about this for weeks, but I haven't because I've been worried I'd jinx it. Uh, but I'm just so excited to have him here. Um, Stu, is, Dr. Dr. McGill is one of the world's foremost experts in back pain, uh, back mechanics. Um, he's a scientist. He also helps people in all sorts of different ways in terms of uh, exercise. Uh, he's just one of the, the pioneering figures in this field, and we're just so, so psyched to have him on the show. Yeah, yeah. so welcome, welcome to the show, Stu. Uh, we've got so many questions. Well, uh, good evening to you two uh, from here, and I know it's good morning uh, in Aussie, but, uh, you know, I have to say, I can't recall ever meeting an Australian I didn't like. <laughs> That's a lot of pressure early in the show. <laughs> well, we, I think Australians and Canadians are kindred spirits in a lot of ways. Uh, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of commonality there, isn't there? Definitely. Yeah. I, 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 I think so. Uh, you have better meat pies and we have better beer. <laughs> <laughs> It's a great combination. <laughs> yeah, 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 you know, my, my father uh, first emigrated to Australia after World War II, and I said, oh, really? well, why did you ever leave? And he says, oh, I love the, the women. I love the culture. It was wonderful, but I just got fed up of beautiful, sunny weather every day. <laughs> <laughs> Life was too good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You get well. He didn't exactly say you get soft, but yeah, that, that was the implication. He, he wanted the challenge. He wanted the challenge of the four C. Yeah. <laughs> now, Stu, we were just whinging a little bit before about how it's the hottest day in uh, the last twenty years in November. It's a blustery hot day, and you were saying just thirty nine. I think thirty nine degrees Celsius. Celsius, and you were saying it's negative twenty just recently. Where you are? So where are you? Uh, the day before yesterday, I woke up to minus twenty. Yeah. Wow. It's proper cold. I've never been in minus 20 of you. No. Uh, I spent a day in New York at the Statue of Liberty, and that was wind chill down to like negative 15, but never, and that was yeah. a three pants kind of day. <laughs> cold, cold I, stuff. I think our coldest day last year was minus 43. Oh, my goodness. Wow. That's amazing. Wow. Um, yeah. And so, I went outside and lifted some kettlebells in the driveway. Did you really? <laughs> <laughs> so, so where are you in Canada? Uh, Gravenhurst, Ontario, okay. which is in Muskoka, uh, two or three hours north of uh, the Toronto airport mm -hmm. for yeah. folks who have to fly in to yeah. uh, come up here. Cool. All right. And so, you're in Sydney. Uh, we're in Melbourne. Yeah. So where oh, you're... Melbourne. I'm sorry. That's all right. I'm, I'm coming to Melbourne at the end of January. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, you've got your course on, which, which I want to I want to dive into a bit later as well. Um, but I believe it's sold out, sure. but there is a waiting list. Uh, so there's still a potential for people to get on a waiting list and maybe get into that course. And it, it's your last well, one well, you're doing yeah. in Melbourne? 
I uh, I think so. I've been to Australia twelve times, believe it or really? not, throughout my career. Yeah. Yes, and uh, I it, it's such a terrible jet lag. It's a horrible flight, isn't uh, it? <laughs> press, you know, it it really is. So I I don't know. I I have a feeling this will be my last one. Although, as I said, I, I thoroughly enjoy Aussies and uh, our yeah. hosts. And, cool. Uh, everything about your country that's great nice. now, now Stu, we've got so much to talk about uh, lots of questions but i thought we'd just start with um rather than starting at the beginning to start with with now uh these days what is what do your days look like what do you what do you get up to well that's a good question i retired from the university about uh, four years ago um, but I have a fairly uh, strict routine now and it follows a seven day cycle so I get up uh, every morning and I just have a very quick scan of uh, emails if there's any emergencies with uh, patients or an athlete or something like that. Then I uh, have a coffee and uh, take my dog out for a walk. Uh, what and time's then wake I'll come up back and Oh, depends, 5.36, something along those lines. Yeah. My next door neighbor, he's older than I am, and he gets up around 4 every morning, yeah. starts up his truck, and shines his lights right into my bedroom oh, window. So that's <laughs> usually my cue. But uh, anyway, uh, my uh, seven-day cycle, you might find uh, interesting, because mm. when I was younger, of course, I was into strength training and, and that kind of thing, but that doesn't suit my body uh, anymore. So two days a week, I do strength training with a, a little bit of power, a little bit of speed, so lighter weights and a bit more uh, speed. Uh, two days a week, I focus on mobility training, uh, which I never used to do before, uh, just to get the things that are a bit sticky, a bit less stuck. I mm. broke my neck C4 uh, 40 years ago. I've had hip replacement. Uh, How did you break your neck? Uh, uh, playing hockey. <laughs> yeah. yeah, four, uh, had a couple of ribs fused. And anyway, I've, I've had quite a trauma history. So now at this stage, mobility is becoming more important. And then two days a week, I focus on doing something else, get the old ticker going. Uh, I might uh, ride my bike, uh, go for a swim, uh, something like that. If it's in the summer, if it's in the winter, I'll go for a cross country ski or something along those lines. So I try and get out every day. That's great. And I have to tell you now. Sorry, I'm a bit of an interrupter. Um, Sue, so I have this thing that I have this fantasy that cross-country skiing would be one of the most amazing forms of cardio because you're out in the beautiful environment. It's it's non-impact. The only problem is it's a five-hour drive to go cross-country skiing for us in in Melbourne. Uh, it is it as lovely as I think it is? I go right out my door. Do you? Oh, oh, that sounds amazing. Yeah, and, and, and it's, it's lovely because you can ski uh, very silently and mm. get right up to deer and moose and, and really? all that sort of thing. I just go right out the back door here, which is uh, endless woods. That sounds amazing. Um, but anyway, uh, that's uh, two days a week. And then the seventh day, I rest. And uh, there's a, uh, I'll reveal a bias, I suppose. There, there's many people today who will post on social media, on my day of rest, I just knocked out 100 kettlebell swings and just did a short 5K <laughs> run. And I think, what are you thinking? You don't know what rest uh, means. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, if you told me when I was 40, I would have no pain. In my mid-60s, I, I would have not believed you. But I have mm. zero pain. I feel absolutely fabulous. That's uh, great. And that, that seven-day cycle suits me well. Mm. Is that, Stu, is that the same kind of program you prescribe to your patients who are 50 and onwards? Is that, do, you, do you prescribe the same sort of stuff that you're doing, the, the, the specifically the high-velocity sort of strength training, stuff like that? Well, every answer when it gets to a prescription like that needs a context. Um, it depends on the pain mechanism because everyone who comes to see me has back pain. So in a way, it focuses me down in that I have a priority to address. So I would say probably not. Uh, for most of the people who see me, they must do core foundational work every day. Uh, and then whatever restorative routine usually has to be a daily effort. Um, interval walks are usually non-negotiable. We can talk about uh, walking and the mechanics and what it does to the spine 
if you wish. Um, however, uh, those uh, that 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 kind of question really needs a a context. But if it's just a friend who does not have uh, any specific pain situations to manage, then yeah, I, I would say that would be a, a mm. fairly reasonable routine. But you know, what, what for for the younger fellows, they want more strength, and uh, they don't need the mobility training. They're already limber. It's mm. it's the injuries that catch up that uh, need addressing a little bit later. Mm. Cool. <laughs> Um, sorry, we interrupted you. So, so you do your training, um, and then what? Where, where do we go from there? Well, uh, I have to do a couple of hours of uh, internet work. Just, uh, I mean, there's some days. All uh, I have had on on one day uh, over 200 requests to see wow. people just, just that day from around the world. So, it, and you know, that it, sometimes it's a bit cyclic. We're we're counting down to uh, the next uh, Olympics. So, mm. you know. Uh, they don't call me the week before uh, with the <laughs> back pain. That's not my world. But to get them ready now, it's yep. it's uh, fairly busy. Or um, yeah, it, it depends on on the cycles of sport and games uh, mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. Uh, what ramps it up and tunes it down. And uh, I I do a lot of uh, I've, I've got a shack out in the bush that I go to and do a little bit of. Uh, just uh, carpentry and plumbing and electrical, and I, I might fish or work on a boat or, you know, just yeah. pottering. Forget the world. Do, yeah, pottering, it, exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's Good very, term. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, then, and so you still are traveling a bit, obviously. So there'll be some times. I, the, I uh, am a, a, a little bit, but uh, not the way I used to. I was on the road for, uh, well, I would book one trip a month, and I mm. did that for. Well, well over 25 years. Mm. Uh, and sometimes, you know, there would be a last minute request, perhaps a, a team would, would want to consult or, a, you know, a national team in another country or something. So it usually end up two weekends or whatever a month. But uh, no, I, I really don't miss that. And, and uh, it just feels fabulous not to be jet lagged for a week yeah. or so every yeah. month. Sounds great. Uh, so I would I would be interested in I I think your story is a fascinating one of a, an outsider in a sense in a clinical sense bringing a mechanical and engineering rigor uh, to to things. Um, I'd like to talk about how you, just your your journey, um, and then we can dive into some questions, specific questions. I want to talk about the Paul Check stuff, uh, which is a thing that passed a lot. Paul Check was pre you, wasn't he? Mm. Yeah, but I think that's really interesting. But just in terms of, if, I wonder if you could just take us through, because uh, I know that your story has some fascinating uh, a level of randomness to it, I suppose, in the sense that you fell into several things. Um, as a high schooler, you you've mentioned in, uh, in uh, Scott Livingston's podcast, which I think is is great. Uh, you mentioned that you weren't that into school and. You've now become uh, this renowned researcher with a, with a PhD, and I think it's it's fascinating to, to take us through that. So, as a high schooler, you were dead set on being an athlete, and you were uh, very into playing uh, NFL. Um, no, well, I don't want to give the impression that I was a good or a gifted athlete <laughs> yeah. at all. Um, I, I used to try hard, I will say that, and I trained hard, yep. but I, I was not a, a good player. But uh, nonetheless, you know, you're a high school kid and, and you don't know any better. So th- that's what really took me to university. There wasn't any academic interest. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I got there, the professors were different than the high school teachers. I remember going to calculus class and uh, this professor saying, look, you don't need to know limits to understand calculus. It's how one thing uh, relates to another. Well, uh, towards the end of high school, I was quitting to become a plumber. Right. And I, I already knew uh, water flow in pipes, for example. And if you neck down a pipe, decrease the diameter, the flow rate and the pressure goes up. So there would be an example of one thing varying with something else. And then the professor says, well, that's the slope of the curve. And the area under the curve is the cumulative water that has flowed through the pipe. I understood that in my hands. That was easy for me. And yeah, that was the turning point. tangible. 
And all, all of a sudden, electricity, magnetism, chemistry, physiology, mechanics, it all just became one science and really flowed mm. for me. And in high school, I thought mathematics was magical gobbledygook. And then it was just unleashed in that first year. And uh, I, I became fascinated by it. But um, I, it, Well, to finish that story off, I went for my master's degree and I chose the university on what uh, had the best cycling, which right. I went up to uh, the French part of Canada and Quebec to cycle in the gap mills at that time. And uh, uh, I did my master's at the University of Ottawa and I met a fellow playing hockey who happened to be a professor at University of Waterloo starting spine biomechanics. So that's how I ended up in spine yeah. biomechanics. And then uh, when I became a professor, uh, different clinical groups would ask me to come in and, and give uh, talks on how the spine worked and became injured and that sort of thing. And they said, would you see patients with us? And I said, well, no, I'm not trained as a clinician. Um, but they said, don't worry, we'll, we'll be there with you. We want to see how you think. And, and now it's come to the point where they invite me to, they'll bring three patients out on a stage and while I assess them and, and show them how uh, I think in reaching a, a very precise uh, uh, diagnosis, which gives them much more direction as to what to guide the patient to not do and what to do. Mm. But, you know, someone will ask me, would you come in and, and talk to our people about your career and career development? And I said, no, please don't pick me because I have the world's worst story. It was pure randomness. But the, the dots kind of join up in retrospect, don't they? So you did an undergraduate degree in physical education. Is that correct? That's what I started at. Yeah. Mm. And then I, I, I ended up with uh, several courses in physics, believe it or in not. physics. <laughs> So undergrad <laughs> physics and then and then the, the mechanics of the spine. Well, my master's degree was in uh, it was in French uh, kin kin anthropology or, or basically kinesiology or mm -hmm. kin anthropology, but that was in biomechanics. Mm, okay. So they they wouldn't even let me into that program until I'd done my core in mechanical engineering. And and so when you have that dual perspective, when you've got that, um, that athletic background, that interest in, in locomotion and how things work, uh, the way that that's going to impact when you're doing that, you know, analysis is going to be different to a person who's come from a pure clinical method because they're more uh, being set down certain pathways, whereas you're staying more objective for longer. Do you think that's part of what you, you do as a scientist rather than as a clinician? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. I, 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 I think it's much more individual and personal than that. Um, could, could I create a foundation with a scientific supposition to give a context yes. to how I would answer that? Yeah. Okay. If, if we start with the idea that all systems in the body need optimal movement with optimal dosage for optimal health. So let's just start there. Every one of those systems also has a tipping point. So if I took a nutritional system, uh, for example, if a person is vitamin D deficient, they're sick. So you supplement and get them out in the sun and all that sort of thing to raise their vitamin D up to a point after which you cross, it becomes a poison. It's too much. Mm -hmm. So there is an optimal tipping point. Every uh, system in the body requires movement and it also has a tipping point. So now who really owns the tipping point and the modulation of it? Is it your family doc? No, of course not. They have no idea about optimal movement and dosage. Uh, is it anyone else in the healthcare profession? No, because they're already managing something where the tipping point has been violated. Uh, no one owns that better than the coach and the trainer. And I truly mean that. They have the potential and the responsibility to get it right because they have the ability to make the largest impact on that uh, person's life. Mm -hmm. So having said that, I don't think physios get the training in the biological systems and these mechanical tipping points. I talk to physios these days 
who've been newly trained, and some of them have never been exposed to Maitland. They don't know that load is a magnitude, a duration, a repetition. It's all modulated by rest and adaptation. Uh, some of them have been taught that it's a psychological intervention now for mm. pain, rather than realizing the link between uh, load. And then I, I asked, well, have you never played jujitsu? It's all about posture and load, and you create pain, and the person submits, and if they yeah. don't submit, the, 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 the tissue will uh, become damaged, either at a micro level that can't be seen with the naked eye, or, or at a macro level. So You mean, Stu, I, you, you I, mean I it's really, not in your imagination? When, when you're <laughs> pinned on the mat, you're not just, uh, it's not a, a social cycle? Well, the, the, that's why I, I, one of the joys of my life when I see patients and I, I for some reason, have gotten known in, in MMA and uh, I, I, I love the science of what they do. It's just fabulous mm. exploitation of mechanics. I hate the destruction of it, of course. Yeah. But to roll on the mat with someone uh, recently, uh, uh, I don't know if you watched the UFC at all, but there's a, a welterweight named Matt. Well, you've heard of Matt Brown. I mean, Matt has fought all the nasty boys in in, in yeah. weight. And just to have a role with him uh, on the jiu-jitsu mat, I mean, it, honestly, he's only going 2% effort. <laughs> but it is just fabulous on how he will just adjust the tiny little angle on my neck for a, a, a joke and it pinches off the carotid mm-hmm. and, and really just, just you have to tap out. And it's a one millimeter adjustment or a two degree uh, angle on a joint Mm. that uh, so greatly compromises it. But um, I don't think physios get this in, in their training. And I, I really fear for their profession now. In fact, most of the patients who come to me say uh, we're done with them. Uh, We we would much rather talk to a a movement uh, specialist. Anyway, sorry for that, but that's why I wanted to start yeah, with no, that. That's a great, great, great grounding. Of, it's uh, interesting just, to me. Um, in Australia, there's a real convergence with physios. In the physio, Australian physios are getting very uh, more than ever. They're acutely aware that they need to be in that domain you're talking about. They need to be prescribing exercise. They need to be involved. Um, a friend of mine, Mick Hughes, is a, is a brilliant physio and an exercise scientist, uh, and he does almost no actual uh, manipulations, treatment. No so manual therapy. No manual therapy. He's very much about, oh, let's, let's fix you with exercise. Let's diagnose with physio and, and exercise science skills, but let's fix you with, with strength. Um, so it is, I think it's, we might be a little ahead of the curve Possibly. here on that, um, but it's definitely a place that physios need to, to be better at, I think. I, I couldn't agree more. Well, I, I think there's more and more physios now looking for leadership within the strength uh, and, and con- conditioning and, and elite coaching community and not the uh, Now, having said that, uh, if uh, you, you travel in some of the circles I do on occasion, if, if you go to uh, uh, a training camp for world-class sprinters, you will see a lot of manual therapy mm. uh, to, to pull out we ultimate to speed. The, the tuning of the, the the difference between first and last, really. Mm. So uh, at that level. So again, you see it's context specific, mm. maybe for uh, everyday situations it's, it's downplayed, but uh, there certainly is a time and a place. Mm. Stu, you touched in there uh, a little earlier about the psychological versus mechanical me- mechanisms of pain. I think also we're in a bit of a shift in terms of uh, clinical work in that a lot of people are considering things a lot more about the psychology and, the, and Laura mosley has got a brilliant TED talk about central sensitization. Do you think there's an interplay between mechanical pain and psychological? Is one dominant or is it case dependent? Or Could you talk a little bit on how you view the psychological side of pain with relation to what you're seeing mechanically and from a, a physical point of view as well? Yeah, that's a fabulous topic. Um, but once again, we need a discussion. So uh, if there is pain, uh, it becomes a little bit easier for me in that I begin with an interview of the person. And and I should just give context for this, because when I was at the university, I was department chair and and had a lot of leeway. Um, I started a back pain research clinic, and we started the appointment times to be 
And my colleagues looked at me and said, you're crazy, two hours to see a patient? And I said, well, I don't know any other way. I have to listen to their story, listen to the impediments of why they failed in the past. Uh, what have they done and, and what has failed? Describe what makes their pain better and worse, et cetera, et cetera. And then I would put together through pattern recognition what tests I would try to create their pain. And then I would do the opposite and see if I could take their pain away. And then that would be a, a fairly, fairly good blueprint on, on coaching them uh, out of pain. So... Uh, believe it or not, after the first year, I turned those appointments into three hours. Wow. So when people want me to distinguish between the mechanical and the psychological, they're one and the same. Mm. Um, you know, people, they, they use this term pain science, which is so, so unfortunate. Pain science, that's been going on for years, and, and I think we've been doing that for 20 years or 25 years at, at the university clinic. We listen to the patient. We understand. We, you know, what is, I'll give you an example. We had a, uh, a world-class strong man uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, when he stood up, he got a shot of pain in his back on his leg. And you would think, all right, the typical pattern recognition would be a disc bulge. He didn't have a disc bulge at all. Provocative testing showed it was all uh, through the neural arch and uh, the posterior tissues behind the spine, the uh, ligamentum flavum and the uh, facet joints. That's what the provocative tests suggested. And then when we looked at the MRs, who some people say are of no use, they're critically important once they have context because we knew what we were looking for. Right. We knew oh, we were yeah. looking at an L. We were looking at an L4 dermatome in the left leg. That's exactly what the MRI showed with yeah. a flattened disc, but no bulge, but enormously hypertrophied facet joints that had had really choked off the neural canal. So when he lifted his head up like this. He, he got a leg sizzle. Well, it was because the neural uh, pathway, the spinal cord, would drift through where the friction was at L4, which gave him a L4 low back pain dermatome and a perfect dermatome rating down his leg. So, you know, that becomes wonderfully informative when all of that is put together. And then we showed him how to start to move without raising his head up into full extension and just avoiding the extensor pain trigger. You know, he got up off the table with no shot of pain and he said, he was on the verge of tears. And he, he said, I, I, I can't tell you how I feel. The tension went out of his face and he says, I have hope. Now, yeah, that's great. did we just do a cognitive behavioral therapy or did we just do a mechanical mm. coaching session based on knowledge of the precise mechanism? And I would submit to you, it's absolutely both. Mm. It is so empowering for a patient once they learn how to control their pain through uh, reverse jujitsu, if you want to think of it that yeah. way, you're not trying to compromise a joint, you're romancing the joint. Romancing the joint. <laughs> and and then their pain is gone immediately. That is the most powerful. And then, you know, I hear these criticisms, oh, you know, McGill creates stiffness and uh, movement fear. When people actually come and practice with us, they, they leave saying that's the most um, poignant display of cognitive behavioral therapy I've ever seen. Mm. And what, what is cognitive behavioral therapy? It, it, isn't it just being a good human, being present, listening to a person and, and, sh and empowering them with uh, ways that they can control and wind down all this and, and you know, we've known about central sensitization for decades and that's what we've been trying to do to wind down the sensitivity mm. we get it if you stub your toe over and over you touch your toe you'll scream mm. stop stubbing your toe and the central sense sensitivity uh wanes away and and we're, we're building robustness again so I, anyway I, I i could give example after example i, I can't separate the two in my mind nor do i think we ever have 
That's, but, that's uh, we, the we best keep getting answer. tagged as this strictly mechanical person. Sorry? It's, it's the best answer because it's nuanced. That's the best answer I've heard to that question. Because people want to put in silos. It's, it's all in your head. It's all in the tissues. It's like, well, no, the tissues are affecting the head, which in turn is affecting how you're moving and guarding and limping and changing behavior around the tissue. Yeah. If we don't address both from both ends, then we leave something empty. We leave something yeah. un, unresolved. Mm. You know, I was department chair of kinesiology for years at Waterloo, which was sociology, psychology, physiology, neurology, and mechanics. Wow. <laughs> you that's can't a good separate combo. any of them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's interesting, isn't it? So, yeah. you know, we used to come at this. Uh, when we did a, uh, a, a large uh, research uh, project, there, were, there, were, there was expertise of all of those areas involved. It's, so I, I don't know. There's, um, I, I think part of the problem is uh, particularly the younger folks, they haven't been schooled on how to consume science. Mm. And the, uh, for some reason, I don't know whether it's the engineering of social media where it's just a sound bite without context. It's just one uh, misrepresentation after another. I think it's the sound bite and the way you actually, uh, you don't get good cut through by being reasonable. If, you, if, if, I did, if we did a post tomorrow and it was about it depends, everyone's going to go, yeah, fair enough. Whereas if you do something really controversial and you put it like a, like a shock jock on radio, you get attention. Well, the Game Changers podcast, Stu, I'm not sure if you've watched that, the, the one promoting veganism and the plant-based diet. and the Game Changers show on, on Netflix. The, yeah. the documentary, and it sits itself very strongly in that camp of being a vegan. And our last podcast from last week talked about, well, it's not, like, no, yeah, eat more vegetables, but it doesn't mean meat, all meat is the devil, and it's not going to instantly kill you and give you a heart attack. It's like, well, it's all about balance. It's all about mm. somewhere in the middle, those areas of grey, that nuance. But I think we've got a situation now yeah, where... where the the medium is biasing towards um, things being sensationalist, and so it's hard to get heard if you're just um, being intelligent and reasonable, which is which is an issue, I guess, isn't it? Um, but yeah. So uh, I'd like to, if you don't mind, Stuart, I think one of the myriad of, of um, benefits of chatting to, to someone like you is that you have a very long history of interest in this space. And you've seen through different um, different eras. So when I was just getting started in this industry in 1999, uh, the rage was Swiss balls. They'd, they'd come in and, and that was uh, they were going to revolutionise the world. And it was bench press on the ball. It was this and it was it was every different thing on the ball. Um, and uh, in my first year, actually, I every time I had a cancellation because you know first year when you're training people, you have a, a bit more time. Uh, I would practice standing on the ball and doing squats on it. And people were like, oh, your core strength's amazing. I'm like, no, it's just a, it's just a party trick I mastered. But anyway, um, the Paul Czech uh, revolution. So in 99, uh, transverse abdominus was basically uh, brought to prominence by some Australian physiotherapy researchers. And um, Paul Czech also started to um, push his sort of methodology. Um, uh I'm really interested in, in your perspective on the way things have kind of evolved from, you know, the 70s through when it was very much like the bodybuilding era and then the Paul Czech thing. Um, yeah, I'm interested to, to think of what you think of all of his uh, drawing in the transverse abdominus. There's been a controversial thing over the years of do we draw in, do we brace? Uh, where have you landed on, on all of that kind of stuff? Well, our opinion has never changed. I mean, I remember meeting with uh, Paul Cech when he was first starting on this mm -hmm. and, and uh, voicing my opinion at that time. Very few people were actually measuring spine stability. Mm -hmm. However, prior to Paul, great athletic performance coaches knew that the hip trumped all other joints mm -hmm. in the body in terms of power production. Yep. So if you stiffen the core or the torso, uh, you get greater power transmitted across to the distal extremities. So there wasn't very many scientists in those days measuring the potentiation of performance with a stiffer core. Mm -hmm. It was only three universities that I knew of, and we were one of them. Right. So uh, our uh, 
view on this has never changed. And when we started, you know, I remember going to a physiotherapy conference and saying, the transverse abdominis does not stabilize the spine. Now you're making a, a, an error here. Here's what does stabilize the spine. Here's how it do, does it. And here's how it helps to uh, create a more resilient spine and potentiate performance. And I remember being yelled at. Yeah. People in the physical therapy crowd standing up and saying, why do you attack our profession? And I think what happened, the physios have a history of anointing gurus, and then they follow the gurus. So, mm. you know, Robin McKenzie, and, and then so many became directional therapy-based, and then uh, the transverse abdominus craze came on, on very little scientific evidence, mm. and then they forgot about McKenzie, and, and then now... Pain science seems to have replaced. And when I first started, it was all about the pelvic tilt. If you had back pain, you give the patient pelvic tilting. Mm. So uh, I don't know why these ears go. I have to blame the professors, I suppose, in shifting uh, the emphasis of curriculum without sufficient evidence. But do you want me to talk about quantitative stability for a moment? Yes. Because that would give us a forum. Mm. So that we can discuss the, the transverse abdominus, what it doesn't do and what it does do. Mm, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, consider my pec major, which is a uniarticular muscle crossing my shoulder. Now, the shoulder is a ball and socket joint and my hips are ball and socket joints. It's no coincidence that the core or the torso has a ball and socket joint at either end. Those joints are made to produce power which is forced through a range of motion. That's what they're made to do. Consider my pec major, which crosses uh, my shoulder joint. Uh, distally, it connects to my humerus. So if it contracts, it flexes my arm around, mm -hmm. as so. But proximally, it bends my rib cage towards my shoulder, like this. So if I could bench press uh, 200 kilo and then use my pec major, do you see... On the distal side, it pushes my arm. On the proximal side, it collapses my rib cage. So I get a net effect distally of zero. If I create proximal stiffness and lock down the core, 100% of that muscle power, which is force times velocity, goes to distal athleticism. So that's why Venus Williams grunts when she serves a tennis ball. It super drives the torso muscles, we call it, um, active expiration, <clears throat> which you do, and if you've been to the fights or serving a tennis uh, ball or hitting in, in rugby, it's all the same to potentiate that stiffness. So the power that's created across the two ball and socket joints, the shoulder and the hip, the, the athleticism and the speed gets directed distally, which is you want. So if you're a rugby player, plant a foot, you cut, turn, Try and do that without proximal stiffness. Your spine just collapses and bends and leaks energy. So that's the first principle of core stiffness. Now, what muscles do that? It is not transverse abdominis primarily. It does about a 2% contribution. But when you measure, if you were to do a flexor sit-up, an extensor lift, a rotational a throw, Pretty much the dominant muscle as you ramp up the challenge is quadratus lumborum. Mm. That's what right. neurally the brain gets. Now, if you were a mechanical engineer taking a flexible rod like a spine and you had to allow it to bear compressive load, you would put guy wires on spans out, mm. down like this. Yep. Well, I just described the attachment of QL to the transverse processes and by uh, an engineering architecture perspective, it's, it, it, it is the most um, architecturally suited stiffener and stabilizer. So if you stiffen the spine, you get to transfer the hip power, as I said, to leg speed or arm speed, whatever it is you want. Um, when we trial that with Muay Thai fighters, for example, and give them more core stiffness through training, guess what? They hit and kick harder mm. and they have faster limb speed. So there would be just an example. What would be an example now, of an exercise that you would like for that kind of core stiffness that you've just described? Okay, can I just finish off yes, the sure. three yeah. principles of yep, the sorry. science? Let me establish the science mm. and then I think the weeds. our yeah, uh, the, the position of our argument is buttressed. Mm. 
So the, the second element is the spine is a flexible rod. So if you put compressive, no engineer would design a compressive rod to bear uh, load. They build an I-beam or something stiff. Um, but the spine will collapse with uh, about, uh, what, 10 kilos of load. It just buckles and falls over. So you have to have guy wires of psoas and quadratus and the obliques and the extensors and whatnot to allow this thing to support loads like picking your baby up out of a crib or deadlifting a couple hundred kilo. It's non-negotiable. You have to do it. The third element is when a joint becomes damaged, it loses its inherent stiffness. Now, stiffness is the right word. It's, it's not a derogatory term. Consider a knee where you compromise the ACL, for example, and knee loses joint stiffness. So when you do a drawer test, you measure shear instability. So instability, uh, joint instability is created when a joint loses normal stiffness. Uh, dynamic disc designs produced this model where this joint has a normal uh, stiffness. L5 has normal stiffness, but L4-5 has lost its stiffness because it's lost height. You can imagine letting some air out of your car tire. It bulges and gets a bit sloppy on the road. Watch. I'm just going to take the spine and apply twisting torque from above. Do you see that there's very little movement at the two stiff joints, it all occurs at the joint that has lost its stiffness. That those micro movements trigger pain. They they load uh, facets. They they load the uh, annulus. They put delamination stresses on the collagen fibers, which are held together with a ground substance. These are not ball and socket joints. They're actually falling into the engineering category of. Uh, the, um, uh, adaptable fabric like your shirt. So if right. I wanted to yeah, work a, a hole in my shirt, I, I'd create stress strain reversals back and forth and the fibers would slowly delaminate. So the collagen fibers in your spine with motion plus load will eventually delaminate. You can see my thumb, which represents the hydraulic gel of the nucleus pressurized behind that will work its way through uh, eventually, um, but uh, we, we would we could talk about tissue adaptations uh, in in to, to finish off that uh, line of logic. But getting back to uh, the, the transverse abdominis, when does the brain go and recruit transverse abdominis? If we apply a load to a person standing straight up and down. You see, you have to satisfy minimum stiffness for stability so your spine doesn't buckle. Do you think your brain goes and activates transverse abdominis? Because it doesn't. The muscle it gets and adds more activation to as you add more load to the person is first and foremost quadratus lumborum, then the extensors, and then the oblique. So transverse is right out of the picture. Well, what, what do you need transverse for? Well, if you've been poisoned, you must vomit. Think of the first night you met Mr. Tequila as a university student. <laughs> what was sore the next morning? Yeah. It was your transverse abdominus. That's what it's for. So to defecate, get rid of vomit, have a baby, all these things. It's, it's, a very, it's a very important muscle. And interestingly enough, when you measure the activation profiles, it's as you build those sorts of pressures to maximally activate it. So we developed a, an exercise to turn on transverse 100%. It's actually laying on your back in a crook lying position and you exhale to low tide. So full air is high tide mm -hmm. where you begin to inspire is low tide. At that point, purse your lips and get all the air out. All of it, everything, everything. Now you've gone to 100% transverse abdominus. What you'll also notice, it wasn't done drawing in. Transverse abdominus just gets stiff. Mm. So this idea that you draw in transverse, our engineering calculations always showed it ruined stability. To stabilize a mask, you have to increase the radial distance of the guy wire system from the mask. So when you look at the 
world strongman competitors, you'll see as a rule, thicker torsos with a bigger belt around it, and they're pushing out into the belt. It is so inhibitory to draw up your pelvic floor and suck in. Uh, just try and sprint or, or lift 100 kilos with that. Mm. So we, in, in, our, um, in our training here, I've always had the belief that, that people took it way too far with, it was like rectus abdominis was the devil. It was like, oh, you, um, you, can't, activate, you can't activate anything superficial. It was all deep intrinsics. Uh, and I never believed that. I never bought that for a minute. I always thought we should be having our muscles work as a team. We do a little bit of deep system activation at the start of our workout so that it can be part of the team. As I guess. We don't spend a lot of time on it. But what we've found anecdotally is that then the other, there's that awareness around your core and then the, everything else just seems to, to work nicely. Uh, do you think uh, there's a place, and then in, in terms of lifting, we do encourage people not to push out but to kind of lock in when they've got under a heavy weight. I'm really interested in, you've coached a, a lot of um, people that lift very heavy weights. Are you uh, cueing them to push out or just brace? What, what, what are your thoughts this on is, that? This is beltless lifting as well, to yeah. clarify. Yeah. yeah. Well, again, the answer is it depends. Mm. Um, but I'll just uh, withdraw just uh, a little bit on that. And, um, okay, if, if you want an exercise that we've measured that mm. creates stiffness in the core, because that's really what we want to create here, to unleash distal athleticism and ensure the spine doesn't buckle and get rid of the micro movements that trigger pain. And the problem with pain is as soon as the brain senses spine pain from an instability, it shuts down the neural drive. And the example I'll give you there, it's a really fun example. Go look at World's Strongest Man 2018. It was in Mogadishu, Africa. We will, we will link to this. One of, yeah, one of the tasks was the 750-pound repeated squat test. So there was a kind of a jig with a 750 pounds on it, and the fellows had to squat it for reps. Uh, so say the one fellow squatted for 14 reps, and, and 14th was the one he failed on. Go and look at the rep before failure on every single competitor and you will see what happened. You're going to see the hips slide a bit to the side, the chest buckle down. There's some little micro movement buckling there. And after that, as soon as the brain senses that they fail, mm -hmm. they won't get another rep. It just shuts down the neural drive. It's like having, you know, a really sore knee and you limp and all of a sudden your knee gives way. Yep. Um, why people don't understand this with the back. I, I don't know. And, you know, this idea of nonspecific back pain. Do you have nonspecific head pain? No, it doesn't exist. You know, <laughs> we have all of these peculiarities about the spine, and it's something that I don't get. But getting back to the exercises that we've measured that gives residual uh, stiffness to the core, which will allow you to do more reps on a strength uh, a test like the one I just described. Mm. And it's the big uh, you know, it works. Who has the highest Wilk score in human history? That's the highest bench press, squat, and deadlift. He starts his warm up with bird dog, side plank, mm. and the modified curl up. Done for 10 second isometric holds. So, those 10 second isometric holds are just neural conditioners to create that stiffness and load bearing ability. So, Stu, if it's an audience, elastic uh, athlete. A little question. So, so, bird dogs, can you repeat that, please? Bird dogs and. All the other two sideline Side planks. planks. Oh no! And then and the modified curl up. If you know our program. sideline planks and a modified or curl up, yeah, cool. or a front plank. Okay. Yep. Yeah, or a front plank. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, what we have measured is a residual stiffness that stays in some people for twenty minutes, and other mm -hmm. people up for an hour or so. That's wow! Great. So if you have a back pain, some micro moments it would be much smarter for them to do those exercises half of the mid-morning, half of the mid-afternoon. Now that gives them two uh, times of respite. But it's for an athlete, uh, you know, many NFL football teams, for example, start all their weight training sessions and on-field games with the big three. Mm. So 
you know, we've we've measured that mechanism. But anyway, I hope that science gives a little bit of a perspective on why we might converge on. I like it. And look, I'm not opposed. If 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 you want to try and draw in uh, as part of an activation strategy, that's fine. I I don't have a problem with that at all. But if if you're I, I have heard some coaches issue that instruction before they lift. And I think Paul checked it at one time mm. as well. And I, I had some discussions with Paul about this. But uh, I, Whereas when you're actually lifting, you're just focused on just bracing and locking. I, I, I think you must. Yeah. I, I've, always felt, non-negotiable. I've always felt that uh, it was one of those things where the physios would say, just, just draw in. I'm like, yeah, but if I've got 100 kilos on my back, just drawing in is not going to get it done. I do need to have – the other muscles, I need, to, I need to be locked in on the lift. There I? needs to be more grunt about the activation and the stability that you're creating. It can't just yeah. be a gentle right. Pilates level thing. You have to actually, uh, like yeah. you said, that forced exhalation type feeling mm. you know, towards a Valsalva type of contraction. Mm. Yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah. But think of, again, you know, uh, <laughs> I've, I've got boys who squat close to 1,200 pounds, by wow. the way, yeah. and uh, they are pushing out into the belt and creating what we call a lifter's wedge, where there's not one millimeter of slackness in their body. Mm. They can't. That car that's on their back will crush them. Mm. But having said that, again, let's go to some of the combative skills, which the whole um, art of combative sports is to exploit the weakness of your opponent. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you make them weak to get a, a submission hold? You wait for them to breathe out. You wait for the yeah. core to become slack and you smash on the, uh, the intervention or the submission or whatever it is. Mm. I learned to appreciate NBA basketball a lot more when I started to consult with some of the players there with back pain and how they play a good game of martial arts under the basket. They do, don't And they? as soon as a player breathes out, Another one will notice, and that's when the back shiver comes and they readjust and and get uh, the dominant position on a player. Um, You know, you think of arm wrestling, all the dirty tricks. Mm. Uh, You wait for that person to exhale, and then you've got them. So, uh, you know, it's, again, the loss of core stiffness that you exploit uh, in those particular uh, situations. But let's look at stay-at-home mom, who might be your client, in the gym. She has no athletic aspirations at all. She just doesn't want to get uh, her back pain re-aggravated again, but it's two o'clock in the morning and she's picking her baby out of the crib. Deadlift doesn't matter one little bit to her. It's far more important that she can lift that 10 pound sack of potatoes in the crib out. Mm. I, I wish trainers would focus on that and tune appropriate stiffness, which again, we go back to that extremism of, Oh, you know, we just brace everybody to an extreme. No, it's coaching, it's coaching, it's mm. coaching. Just the term sufficient stiffness seems to have eluded a lot of people. Yeah. Just sufficient that's a, stiffness. That's a good term. It's, the thing is, um, it's, uh, tying back to what we are talking about before, you are going to uh, not get a lot of traction if you come up with an article saying uh, about sufficient stiffness because people, it, when it's reasonable, it's not remarkable. <laughs> I think it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Well, but it's, it's important. Yeah. Um, just talking, I've got something that is unreasonable but very common, and that is uh, probably our pet hate in this building, burpees. Now, you, are, oh. <laughs> you have done tremendous amount of research on, um, on the spine. Uh, you've, you've reverse engineered the mechanism of how to destroy a disc on um, on pig cadavers, uh, no one knows more about how to mess up a spine than you. Uh, tell us about burpees and what you think about them. Don't hold uh, back. I, I'm, I've got a comment on that pig cadavers. That's again people who've taken our work, and that's what they've said. Oh, really? We, oh, you know, absolutely. There's mm. not a medical condition or an orthopedic disease or an injury that hasn't used animals because Mm -hmm. human cadavers are old. Mm -hmm. If I want to mimic you Mm -hmm. and your behavior, I would have to get a younger animal and I would need 40 identical spines. That's Mm -hmm. why we use animals. Mm -hmm. But of course we calibrate the results up from the animal studies Mm -hmm. to the humans. So Mm -hmm. this, 
idea that we, we just use animal studies. Of course, we had to. That's how you get the scientific control to understand the mechanism. But then you have to calibrate the mechanism to the human. So yeah. I, I, I have to dispel these, these myths that I keep <laughs> hearing about myself. But anyway, back to, to burpees. As I try and do, can I start with a scientific supposition? Yes, yes. please. Okay. We're talking about a game of adaptation. So as I mentioned earlier, the uh, discs of the spine are not ball and sockets. They're an adaptable fabric made with collagen fibers that are held together with a ground substance. So if we take a spine and bend it back and forth over and over again, that's fine as long as there's not high load. And the ground substance holding the collagen fibers together gets less viscous, which allows the spine to become more flexible. So be it. However, don't ask that person to become a lifter or uh, compete in strongman or do repeated Olympic lifts or something like that because they've adapted their spine to have looser collagen fibers and they will delaminate faster with movement under load. So they've created a mobility adaptation, which is fine, but everything in fitness is a trade-off. So they traded off load-bearing ability to gain that mobility. Now let's take the other side of the coin. If you take a power lifter, they become so stiff they can't even scratch their ear. Well, you, you might say lots well, of very special athleticism, but they traded off mobility and stiffness in the collagen ground substance so those fibers can contain massive nuclear pressure behind them. Uh, but they've lost mobility. So most people want it. Uh, somewhere in the middle, but that's where the trickery and the tuning of it comes. Mm. So when I see people uh, in certain programs doing 10 burpees, and then they go and do 10 Olympic lifts, they've just confused the adaptation of their discs, that adaptable fabric. Um, if you want to do burpees, go ahead, do all sorts of, you know, I do portal movements and it's all fabulous stuff. Do yoga and all the rest of it, but don't lift heavy. You've just created uh, a risk and a maladaptation for that particular uh, biological tipping point. Um, so you'd be wiser to avoid burpees unless you have incredibly mobile hips and shoulders and you don't need to put the mobility into the spine, but I haven't seen a burpee conducted that way. So it, it, it doesn't make conditioning sense. And the next example I'll give you would be sit-ups mm. in the context that that's been studied a little bit more. When you do a sit-up, you repeatedly flex the spine over and over again. And on average, and you know when you look at the U.S. military studies and whatnot, in basic training, as you know, uh, every year the uh, American Marines have to pass a sit-up test. So they train the test. What the military found was if they don't train with sit-ups, they have less pain, but they do better on the sit-up test. And they <laughs> do things like, uh, okay, let's go get a, uh, a gym ball and you do a stir the pot exercise. We on love the gym stir ball. the pot. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. exactly how I would rehabilitate an M MMA fighter. Mm. Uh, stop doing the thousand sit-ups every day that they've done because mm. that's tr tradition in karate training. Mm. And uh, you replace it now with, with stir the pot. Guess what? They get back to pain-free rolling jujitsu on the mat and they become more athletic. Yeah. So the issue with burpees and sit-ups and things like that is in of itself, it's not a bad exercise if that's all you want to do but it it you reach the tipping point before you get fully trained mm -hmm. why wouldn't you use a stir the pot which mm -hmm. has a huge reserve between the tipping point and the delamination stresses in the annulus so you can really get trained mm -hmm. do, you, do you see what i mean the 100%. athleticism you can tolerate on stir the pot is so much beyond a sit-up or a burpee so it, what we're trying all exercises are are tools and we're trying to create efficient tools move the tipping point uh in, in 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 the best possible way so with that scientific foundation and and line of logic 
I really can't argue for, for, for a burpee or a setup for the general public. Mm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So if burpees and setups are out in terms of what is great for core training in terms of general athleticism and longevity of your spine and things like that, how would you go about training the core? So you've got your big three. You've got the bird dog, the side plank, and the modified curler. They're your big three in terms of prep and creating that sort of that trickle-on stabilization effect for 20, to 20 minutes to 60 minutes. What sort of exercise are you programming for your, if you want to pick your martial artists, for example, in terms of really developing that, that high-end core stiffness and stability? Uh, okay. What sort of exercise, well, what sets and reps, what sort of, how are you programming that stuff? Right. Well, I, I, I should say that for terms of reference, if, if you're just an average person wanting to get through life and be an awesome 85-year-old grandmother or grandfather, just do the big three. Yeah. But th- that, that's not what you asked. You asked for elite performance. Well, the answer is it depends once again. But let's go back to that idea of, of really understanding what creates core stability and enhancement of performance. Have you ever run into a child in the neurology ward with a paralyzed quadratus lumborum? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, you can probably imagine what they move like. Watch them walk. So say they have a left-sided paralyzed QL. They can left leg support, swing their right leg, and when they stand on the right leg, the left side collapses. So left, left leg, they walk. The left side collapses because the quadratus lumborum isn't there and the pelvis tilts. So they walk right, left, right, left. Mm. So you see, you can't even walk properly without a quadratus lumborum. Well, let's super drive that now with a loaded carry. So when we start building uh, superb core performance, loaded carries then become non-negotiable. So what are the sets and reps? Well, once again, it depends. If you're a world-class strongman, they'd be heavier load, shorter distance. For an MMA fighter, it's going to be many repeats of short distances. So uh, how we arrive at that is we catalog the demand of the sport. When I first started in MMA, I would say to the coaches, what are the physical demands of this sport? And they couldn't answer the question. I was really quite surprised. So I said, well, how much time do they spend in isometric control, you know, on their back or against the cage? What is the endurance demand of that isometric control? Well, it could be a minute or two. And then they have to burst up with an explosive performance, get on their feet, and and then uh, unleash explosive uh, athleticism. Um, and then, you know, the rounds are five minutes. Well, can they, can they drift a little bit like a rugby player or a soccer player? Well, no, they can't because they're going to go to the hospital very quickly if they do yeah. that. Now you're, 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 you're blending all of these athleticisms, but nonetheless, they're quite fighter specific based on whether they're a, a ground fighter or a stand up fighter or whatever. When we catalog those demands, now we get much more directed as to build the fighter's capacity, make sure they can meet those demands. And when we measure what the sport requires, and then we measure what the athlete can do, we train the difference. Mm. So loaded carries quite often for heaviest Australian rugby players, as Aussie rules, no and, question. Um, uh, symmetrical or asymmetrical? Do you have a preference? Symmetrical or asymmetrical? Oh, I have science that guides me on that. Mm-hmm. So if, consider if you had 20 kilos in both hands, that's called a farmer's carry. Mm. Now I'm going to put down one of the weights and I'm just going to carry 20 kilos just in one hand. So cumulatively, I'm only carrying half the weight, correct? Yep. What's, what's more load on the spine? A suitcase of 20 kilo or a farmer's of 40? I would say the suitcase. Yes, you're absolutely correct. So some people say, well, I'm going to go. Yeah. So do you see how it's very interesting how it stands out? You might want to start with a farmer's walk, but we usually don't. We start with a much more modest suitcase carry to Mm -hmm. get the asymmetry going and really challenge. challenge. And and Uh, I mean, you just feel that if you're carrying two bags of of shopping, you know, like it's so much easier to carry the shopping in both hands than it is in one because you you, you feel it differently. How come the physios don't understand that? (laughs) (laughs) We just needed a shopping analogy. (laughs) 
So on top of the loop. No, I mean that was that was a that was a rotten. Uh, <laughs> I, I get that, and you know, I, I'm look. I there are fabulous yoga instructors, fabulous physios, fabulous mm. surgeons, fabulous professors, and there are horrible professors and horrible physios and horrible. Stuff. So you know, I of course I I shouldn't be so so. Uh, cavalier i suppose <laughs> I, I i have to be more responsible do, than that do you know Stu? I, I, you just sparked me wanting to talk to something that i've i've noticed about about you watching your career from afar uh, over the years um i have a theory that the the key to a wonderful career is a combination of um a kind of a compounding power of of, of three forms of excellence uh and it's treating people really well it's doing world class work, and it's sharpening the saw. So I feel if you combine those three things, uh, in isolation, each of those things can help you have a good career. But you can't have a great career unless you are both producing world class work, keeping yourself in good shape mentally and physically, and exhibiting kindness. And often you'll see people who've got their, they've got their they've got their shit together, they've got their act together in terms of their their work, uh, and they look after themselves well but they will miss or even over time lose that humility and kindness. Uh, yours is almost palpable how you are very uh, generous in your perspectives on people. Is that something that you've deliberately cultivated or is that just, you just, uh, that's just how, how you are? I would go for the former. I, I, I think I was a mean son of a gun as a, uh, certainly as a teenager Mm -hmm. and uh, a, a younger man, and uh, those people, uh, I, I was a little more combative when I was younger. But uh, So that's why I'm going with the latter. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you learn it, you cultivate it, and uh, it comes from spending time with people. So, you know, I, 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 I'm not on social media, but, you know, someone will show me a post and they'll, They'll contrast, say, Pete O'Sullivan and myself, or Lorimer Mosley and myself. Mm. Well, I know both of them. I've known Pete since when he started as a professor. He's a wonderful fellow. We, mm. He stayed at my house. He knows my kids. And, yeah. you know, people don't realize that all we do is have conversations. And, and Pete's right on a lot of things. And we don't agree on everything, but that's fine. And it's spending time with people that shows you that's all we are. And, uh, I, I was in the, uh, Caribbean a little while ago. I go down there and sail every now and then. That's and, nice. uh, there was this wonderful old gentleman took me on a taxi ride and, uh, we were having just a, a general conversation about people around the world. And he says, oh, it's just a rainbow world. And, uh, we, we said something else and he said, look, uh, if, and, you know, depending on, on your beliefs, but he said, if, if God or, or biology or mother earth, whoever is your, uh, God made that person, mother earth or God has to love that person. Mm. And, and so must you. And, you know, it's, it's, everybody has something to offer on this. Mm. Uh, now I, I know there's one or two baddies that I, I think one of these days they'll grow up. And uh, realize that. But, a couple uh, of bullies out there, aren't there? Well, I, I think that they're just a little bit misguided. Mm. And they will come around. Uh, at, at this stage in my life, you know, I don't need anything more. It, it's just about helping my family and, and my patients. And uh, trying to create a better soul. And that mm. just, it, it goes out and comes back and a million times. We, the, the chancellor of our university used to be a fellow named David Johnson. He became the governor general of the country eventually. Wow. But he said, you know, when you do something for someone, it comes back 10, mm -hmm. 10 times. And I thought, well, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, <laughs> but it isn't most that's, of the time it comes true. And that shouldn't yeah. be the reason why you do no. it. But it just happens when you do it. Uh, it helps everybody get better. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. So I talk too much. No, I'm you sorry. don't. I, this, I, this is. I, I this have is to tell you, I, I listened to one of your podcasts just to try and get a 
uh, an understanding of, of you two. And I, I sent you an email afterwards, and I'll just say it publicly now. You two are the most uh, eloquent uh, and come from just such a place of deep understanding. Uh, you know, Vince Lombardi, that they would ask him, what makes you such a great football coach? And it wasn't that he knew football. He said, I know men, which mm. meant he understood people. Mm. And uh, you two are uh, phenomenal at your job. Oh, th- that's, that means so much. I don't think I've ever been called eloquent ever. Thank you so <laughs> much, Stu. I appreciate that. Thanks, Stu. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Now, um, we've uh, monopolized your time for quite a while. I'd like to wrap up shortly, but what I really want to hear all about is – uh, Backfit Pro and the courses. Uh, so we're going to be seeing you. I'm, I'm immensely looking forward to, to the, the course uh, in January. In January. Uh, tell us about. Uh, don't don't have to go into obviously full detail. It's a, it's a four four or five day course. But uh, who's it for? How does it work? Um, I'm I'm very excited to to be there. Well. The four days are broken up into three courses. The first two days is a foundation course, which will describe how the spine works, how it becomes injured, and pathways to pain. Uh, and we'll be uh, interspersing that with four or five workshops on uh, movement uh, primarily. The second course is on assessment. How do you reach a precise diagnosis of the mechanism of pain. How do you prove that that's true? And then you use that as a roadmap for coaching what to do and not do. Now, if the person can change their pain with a different posture or a different stiffness or a different movement pattern, it's mechanical back pain. There's no question that this will involve their psyche. If you rob a person of their sleep, they'll become psychologically uh, weak, magnify things. We know all this. Mm. But the question is, how, how do we build back that mental and physical constitution? And we start with the mechanical, but while we're doing it, we're just trying to be really good people. Mm. Uh, the third element is now, assuming you've been successful at winding down the pain sensitivity, it's time to enhance performance. So understand what the goals are, and we will be workshopping different Uh, very specific uh, exercise tools and regimens and programming to build the capabilities in that person given their age, their injury history, their goals, and all the rest of it. So those are the four days. That sounds sounds uh, wonderful. uh, uh, Well, I I, I won't bias it anymore. (laughs) Uh, If you can't get into this one in the strongest possible terms, I suggest you um, do think about this in the future. I, I think... Having this as part of your tool, this kind of thinking as part of your toolkit is a kind of investment that just pays for itself um, many, many times over. Uh, Sue, so in terms of the attendees at your courses, uh, what's the mix? Obviously, there's going to be different clinicians, there's going to be coaches. Uh, is there an average mix that you tend to see at these things? Yeah, there is. We had uh, 130 last week in Edmonton, Alberta. There was uh, five physicians. Uh, or six, actually. One of them was our own, uh, or at least one of our, what we call master clinicians that we certify in our program. Uh, There was uh, 30-some-odd physical therapists, 30-some-odd chiropractors, about 30 strength and conditioning coaches. Uh, There was yoga teachers, massage therapists. In other words, I don't care what your background is. Mm. What I care is that you have a passion to change people's lives and the people that are the subjects here are people suffering with back pain. Mm. That it is, sounds like a great mix and that's an awesome note to finish on. Um, Sue, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I can't tell you how much we appreciate having you on the show and uh, we can't wait to meet you in person. Uh, it's, uh, it's All right. Great. Well, I've enjoyed this very much, uh, Durham and Jacob. And uh, I'll look forward to coming to uh, Melbourne and uh, having a beer and a laugh. And, having a beer uh, and a meat pie, yeah? You're going to bring the beers? <laughs> uh, if you bring the meat pie. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, Stu. Can't, can't wait to meet you in person. All right. Same here. Day. Thanks so much. Guys. See ya. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye. 
And before you go, hear from some of our alumni about our career transforming course, the online mentorship. Learn more about how you can join at our website. I learnt the theory stuff at uni, but I didn't know how to apply it. And coming to Core Advantage was how I, I bridged that gap. So I, I knew the stuff, but I didn't know how to do the stuff. It was something that I needed to do personally for my own development. And it's allowed me to work in elite sport for now five years. So it was a massive help. I think mentorship is really important and being able to ask questions all the time and the Core Advantage course allows that because there is a big team of people that you can ask questions. I get to um, you know, train professional athletes every week, um, work really closely with professional athletes which is awesome. A lot of the skills that I'm applying uh, I learnt through the program at Core Advantage. It's not just something that you read and then think about and then go, oh, how, how does that tie into everything? It's, it's something that you, practical that you can turn around and go, this is exactly how I'm going to apply it. Um, and the concepts that you learn help you as a, as a coach, as a professional, as a person. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Definitely go and do it. To sign up for the online mentorship, head to coreadvantage.training mentorship.